Anyway, Chuck had, I, had another uh, But story. by the way, I think he's a little jelly. You know, this guy's done some acting and stuff. I think he's a little bit jelly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh no. Career. No, very jelly. <laughs> yeah. Very. Well, I'm, I'm, I mean, it's almost <laughs> like, you mean we could have put an act together years ago? I just... I'm just well, it so took me 40 years to come out of my shell, so... <laughs> <laughs> So I got home, I was talking to Becky, and she says, well, well, how'd it go? I said, good. And she said, what they ask you? And I said, well, they asked me this and that. And I said, and I kind of locked up on the, uh, what's the craziest thing you've ever been asked to do? And she says, you didn't tell them about the helicopter? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, but that is a great story. So... Are we ready to launch we're, into it? We're we're rolling, sir. <laughs> okay, bring, bring us said helicopter story. Yes. Okay. okay. Two thousand two, fall of two thousand two. We're in Walterboro, South Carolina, doing a film called Radio. Oh yeah. Mike Tolan directing, Herb Gaines, Sarah Flam, that whole group. So we're uh, it's a football movie, as far as sports goes. It's a you know human interest story about the. Uh, sort of the team mascot radio and coach Jones played by Ed Harris. So we're, we're, we've done a lot of stuff. We've done the school stuff. We actually built a practice football field adjacent to the high school field that was there, their stadium for Walterboro high school. And we, they, so the team uh, did their scrimmages and stuff like that to get used to playing. And it had Mark Ellis was our, right. Was our uh, Summer sport, catch. sports coordinator. Yeah. And one tree Hill. In he One did. Tree Hill, that's yeah. correct. Yeah. So um, we had to wait until later in the fall to get the stadium because they, season. they had their season and maybe maybe one playoff game or something like that. And so when that, when that uh, finished up, we got to use the stadium. And um, so we had several days of – and nights, actually, several nights of high school football boarded for, you know – whatever, four or five nights, something like that. So I think we started on a Friday night, shot that night, shot Saturday, and it started raining Saturday night during filming. And they kept playing and turned the field into an absolute quagmire. Oh, God. Before they cut, you know, they wrapped. And um, a, little, a little back up, the Citadel had offered them the use of their full field tarp before the show started for no for no cost but they declined because they then they'd have to have a crew to put it down take it up put it down take it up and so forth free isn't free yeah exactly so anyway so it rains all day sunday we come in monday morning it's still just pouring rain and so they say well what are we going to do so well the short answer is i don't know but we need to start by covering the field somehow. So we bought every roll of Visqueen in <laughs> Colleton County. We at least covered the field, and by Monday night it stopped raining. So Tuesday morning we went back and uncovered it. And we got fans out there. We got heaters out there. We even got the electrical department to bring 10Ks out there and just set them up mm -hmm. in the field. Mm -hmm. and you could see the steam coming out of the mud from the uh, heat yeah a bunch of dinos would have been nice about that <laughs> yeah so that was that went for uh, like a couple of days and wow. we just weren't getting anywhere so sarah flam says we're we're dead in the water what are we going to do and i said we need air and we need a lot of it i said have the film commission call the governor and see if we can get his helicopter down here Turns out the <laughs> governor doesn't have a helicopter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> whenever he needs to use a helicopter, they use the South Carolina Air, um, National either, Guard. The, either the Nas National Guard or the Coast Guard. Mm. So that was off the table. So we contacted a flying service in Aiken, South Carolina. And the next day, two guys show up in the old-timey Whirlybird. It's the oh. glass bubble, two guys come in and so we met with them briefly and they spent the next eight hours hovering about 
six or eight feet off the ground, just covered the field in a grid. Oh, my. Back and forth, back and forth. How about those sound effects, guys? <laughs> yeah. This is a quality production. <laughs> yeah. It sounded like them going right by us. They, they went to the uh, local airfield and fueled up once, came back, and f they went until uh, dusk. So I mean, yeah. they couldn't see anymore. Uh, and I guess they had to quit before then because they had to get back to their, right. to their, uh, their home before dark. Uh, this was not fly by night or fly by wire. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, literally. Technology. So it really helped a lot. You know, it, it dried it out, at least the surface, so it looked like something. One of our greensmen uh, was from uh, Hilton Head, uh, not Hilton Head, but um, St. Simon, Georgia. And he used to be in the uh, work on golf, uh, golf course maintenance. So he contacted all of his network down there. And these guys mow the greens and the fringe every day, which is... Uh, overseeded rye grass, so it's green. And he got them to bag up their cuttings oh. every day. And we sent a steak bed down at the end of the week and got, I mean, steak bed full of trash bags of green clippings. So we filmed Friday night and Saturday night. And we had a group, we went out Friday afternoon with our grass and just spread it on the field because it looked green. You know, it didn't have any depth to it, but it right. had color, and it did have texture. And you're on top of, like, mud, basically? Well, it's, it's dried out some. You know, the first gotcha. probably, you know, if you dug deep, it'd still be pretty uh, pretty bad under there. But it's chewed up, and it's you're, you're but just covering the spots. it's what we had. Yeah. So we lined the field. We yeah. did the whole thing, and uh, so they started playing again. And it worked out. They shot uh, Friday night and Saturday night. But every time somebody got tackled— They'd be covered in grass clippings. So they'd, have to, they'd have to clean them off and then put more clippings on the field where they'd just gotten up from. Right, right, sure. So we had to stand by a grass clipping guy, or two or three of them. And then... Um, Did that fall under construction did that fall under props somehow it fell under construction okay you know we did have a green screw <laughs> i was gonna so, say uh, we had the onset greens and plus one gotcha i think um so sunday we were filming the high school graduation scene on that same field uh it was on the visitor side in the bleachers so we had to go in sunday morning and we essentially painted the dirt the mud the clippings whatever we just painted them all green right a, a version of green you know right <laughs> and they had their graduation that afternoon and that was it for that field i mean it was uh <laughs> you know <laughs> but it worked you know it worked enough oh my gosh Um, so if time was allowed, I have one more yes. kind of a short story go, go. that is, uh, has a lot of people involved that are near and dear to us. <laughs> on, um, as long as Chuck thinks it's funny, we're good. <laughs> well, it's not, it's, it's not funny. It's, uh, oh, okay. Not funny, haha. -ha. It's uh, funny like, ooh, oh, let's go. We need a woo woo. So uh, we were, were working on a Year of the Dragon, and my department had gone – away management had gone back to england not to come back it was either at thanksgiving or between thanksgiving and christmas so uh it was my second film and i was the head of the, my own department there were, we had 12 of us and uh, by that time we were shooting locations and the back lot for chinatown so on a uh, a sunday they were scheduled to shoot downtown uh down at water street looking back up to Front Street, and then in the distance was First Presbyterian Church. It's got the rooster mm -hmm. on top. So on Saturday, after business hours, the, okay, uh, Michael Cimino wanted the rooster removed and a cross put up there to match Greenpoint in New York. I, maybe it's in Brooklyn. I'm not sure what part of town that's in. But we'd right. taken the old Mickey Rats and turned that into the Greenpoint funeral home. And... 
I think the thinking was the camera was going to be down around Water Street shooting east, and the Brewster slash cross would have been in the distance. So Bobby and uh, Bobby Huber and his crew were tasked with taking that rooster out and replacing it with a cross that Butch Trulove had built out of aluminum. And it was a dimensional cross. It was very uh, figurative. It, and that's a very tall steeple, and I think it's a stone steeple as well. It is both. So they get up there, and, and this is like, how high is it? I don't know. This is the crane. So they ordered a crane. The crane shows up, set it up. And this is, once again, this is after sort of business hours for the church. And they have a basket, and they get up there, and they're, um, they can't reach it. So, But it's not by much. But it's not by much. Yes. But so uh, Scott Hillman, Scooter, and two or three other guys, myself, Butch. Do you remember James Wade? Uh-huh. Who oh, sure. Butch's, um, yep. Who happens to be Alonzo Wilson's brother. I did not know that. Wow. Until, wow. until I did James not know passed that. away. And I, um, and, uh, I had said, posted something on Facebook, and Alonzo says, you know that's my brother, don't you? I had Never no knew. Never, Never knew, knew that either. Yeah. Um, so anyway. Um, Scooter and you guys. We come back to the welding shop. So Butch is there. Uh, Wade's there, and they build a jib extension, 12 feet long, in the shop at night. This is, I'm I mean, talking. This, this is hardcore. I'm talking. This is two or three o'clock in the morning yeah. at night. And this is hardcore they take problem it, solving. They take it back to the set. They put it on the crane. They get back up there, and I don't know if that rooster had ever been removed once it was placed there, but. Um, can't Bo- imagine. Bobby had had uh, Butch put a uh, inch and a half steel pipe through the through the center of that cross down the bottom. I think he had him run it six feet down, and um, so they got the rooster out. I mean, that was laborious. It had it had a shaft on the bottom of it. It appeared to be threads, but it wasn't threaded like a screw. I think it was probably for maybe a lubrication to get it mm-hmm. in to have a channel for that to live in you know so anyway they uh, after uh after a long time they got it out and they got the cross up there so the cross is eight feet tall plus the plus shaft the on there six. so you're talking that much above the steeple and they get it down in there and it and it hits <laughs> hits something before it's seated so they have to pull it back out and I talked to Bobby about this, and they got the got them to to bring the porta band up into the basket. They cut four inches off of the pipe, placed it back in, and by this time it's starting to become daylight, and right. the start, shooting crew starting to show yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I'm not mistaken, they may have used that parking lot. No, they couldn't have because church was in that day. I was thinking about, um, I don't know where base camp was. That was a go-to parking lot for many years. Mm-hmm. Right, but this was a Sunday, yeah. so right. it would have been a church day. Yeah. So um, they said, yeah, you guys got to get out of here. I said, yeah, <laughs> we're where? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Bobby said all they had left at the time was bailing wire. So they just put bailing wire all over that cross and to fasten it to whatever they could find to fasten it to. Got the hell down from there, wrapped it up, got the crane out of there. And fortunately, they were given the entire day on Monday to reverse the process. But, I mean, the my favorite part of that story is they came and they built a, an extension. A 12-foot jib extension. That someone's going to ride. Well, it's well, it, well, it's it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna extend the ability for the basket to go higher, yeah. but but still, all that weight is on this brand new well. Yeah, it's practical. You know, it's, it's practical. practical, and it's um, I say it's it's engineered by common sense. Yes, like yes. you know, these guys are professionals. Well, rigorous. Butch Butch was one of those guys. Yeah, Butch was one of those oh, guys. He God. he would leave no stone unturned. No. Nope. And Scooter was there. He's a welder. Yep. They, Very I good mean, welder. They busted it out. James yeah. Wade. And so, and so basically you, you take the basket off the crane, put in the jib arm, and attach the basket again. Correct. I got you. Yeah. 
Holy smokes. This is during a work session. And, and this and this is literally between Saturday and Sunday when they're shooting. Saturday afternoon, yeah. late, and Sunday morning. Yeah. And, no. it's, yeah. and it is, I think, the tallest steeple in Wilmington. I, bl- I believe you're right. Yeah. To witness it was like... <laughs> I, to witness every moment as it yeah. transitioned and transitioned. That, you know, and it was a day, you know, it was a, a day, a night, you know. Yeah. And plus, we weren't working all nights. No. So it was like, okay, you are yeah. you worked Friday. Okay, you come in Saturday afternoon. Yeah, and you're going to work until. You're, you're going to work until. <laughs> and, uh, and that, was, that was a crazy thing. And it brings about what I call the Bobby Huber rule, which I learned very early on because um, he was key grip on the first movie I worked on. And an endless um, cycle of ridiculous requests mm-hmm. <laughs> would come to Bobby. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Just unheard of. And he would, and he would always just take a moment. He would never. He would never. Let me put it this way. He would never say no. He yep. would never lose his temper. Yep. He'd always say, "Give me fifteen minutes. Yeah, let's give us some air. Yep. Give me yeah. fifteen minutes." Yeah. But then he'd, he'd, al- he'd also say, "Cool." <laughs> well, he cool. saved our bacon at another uh, time on You're the Dragon. As our budget ran out, we started at the top of the street for the for the um, Chinatown and spent the big money. As we got to the bottom of the street, <laughs> we were running out of running out of uh, resources. No kidding. And so all the interiors had had roofs built over them. Right. And Albert Blackshaw says, "You know what? We don't." We can't afford to put a roof over this one. We we put we built flats, ceiling flats, and co- covered them on the top. We wrapped them in bisqueen, right, and just set them in. And so, um, as they were, it was an interior of a uh, Italian restaurant. So they go in there that day, and I wake up about three in the morning, and it is just dumping. Uh. And I, you know, I know. I said this is going to be an awesome day. <laughs> so I, I'd, I'd go ahead and get dressed, and I'd go ahead and drive in. Yeah. And the fucking place was leaking. It was a press tin ceiling on the inside, but the leaks were just where the um, seams were. Where the seams and where the um, some of the attachment for the gotcha, tin. gotcha. So we ended up. Uh, I guess we leaned on set dressing. They got cup hooks. We screwed them into the ceiling, and these little, um, they're like little buckets. Oh, yeah. And we hung them under each leak. <laughs> and so they had to <laughs> empty them. Empty them and, and refresh them. But in the meantime, I, I, Bobby was our key rigger on that show. I went to Bobby. I said, I don't know what we can do, but we need to do something. So he says, okay. Same thing. Yeah. He thought for a minute. So he rallied his troops, which was he, Dennis, uh, Scooter, mm-hmm. um, Indian, Ned, mm-hmm. Jim Cody Harrington, mm-hmm. and Steve Graves. Yep. And they built a roof out of rope. They started at the back, the back of the facade right. to moor it and then took it to the back of the set. So we had the um, rafters were rope, and then we laid Visqueen over that in a – Yep. In a pattern that let it drain, and worked that like a got champ. us through the day. Yep. Yeah. No, that yeah. that you know. I mean, that's circus rigging right there. Yeah. Well, but, you know, yeah, it's just of. his ability to improvise, and like you said, with no attitude. Ne- I I never heard him say no. Yeah. You know, he, I've heard him say, "I need twenty four hours." And I don't heard him say that once. Yeah. Um, but you're right. I mean, his his ability to just think on his feet. Yeah. Just that yeah. was that was his genius. You know? and, um, and and safely. And safely. And that was the other thing too. It was never half. Keep in mind, it's still it is pouring rain this whole time that this is going on. Right. Yeah. Right. The whole time. Yeah. The whole time it never let up. And no you're way. refreshing the little buckets. Yeah, they're refreshing <laughs> the buckets inside. And and yeah, trying to shoot away from as much water yeah. as they can. Oh but they were any uh, big old tent spikes? Any big bull pricks involved? You know? No. They did uh everything was rope and plastic. Right. And yeah. 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 I've seen Scooter, you know, Some swing a twenty twenty pound hammer oh, single handed. Uh, I, I I have the ultimate story. I don't let me go ahead and tell her right now. Uh sleeping with the enemy. Uh, the house we built on the beach mm-hmm. in North North Wrightsville. Um I was one of the I, I was I was the um, I was the rigging key on that show, mm-hmm. 
And I also volunteered to go up and be an astronaut in the moonlight that uh, Fergie and Bobby had built, the mm -hmm. octagonal shaped moonlight. And so I'm up inside of it, <clears throat> and it must be 40 mile an hour winds. At the, at the beach. You know, yeah. Yeah. keep in mind, at, we're at, at the night. Beach. Yeah, at night, of course. At night. And I mean, and literally, the basket is literally like at 30, 35 degrees constant. And uh, I guess, was Bobby the key on that? I can't remember. I can't remember who the key was. Anyway, Scooter grabs six foot lengths of pipe and a sledgehammer and is going out to do tie off points. Now it is pitch black. The moon is doing this, so where he needs to go, there is no light. Mm -hmm. And through the howling of the wind and just the movement in the basket and the and the the ballast banging against each other. Way out in the distance, I see these flashes, flashes, and it's every time Scooter's sledge hits the top of the pipe, it sparks, and so it's and very faintly through this driving when I'm hearing kink, 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 and he's just that son of a bitch never missed. One handed, single hand, six, and you got to remember he was three feet tall. Yeah. So I mean, you know it. Mm -hmm. Most impressive thing I ever saw a human being do. I yeah. mean, no one can top. Scott Hillman in the dunes of Wrightsville Beach at 2 o'clock in the morning. And that was poetic. With the 20 uh, pound sledge. Delivery, yeah. uh, uh, it, it is one of the most memorable moments so of my film. Did career. you use the tie offs? Oh, are you yeah. kidding me? Slowly, we leveled back. I think we got about to about five degrees. You got the moon back and, in place. And, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, the DP went, that's good enough. Let's go. You know. Oh my God, that was, that, that's a crazy show. I'll have to bring somebody and tell that, so those stories. But anyway, yeah, Scott Hillman. Uh, yeah, kudos. You know, yeah. big time kudos. You know. yeah. Undervalued. You know, uh, over the years, it's hard to, uh, it, you know, when we were in the early days in the Dino era, Right. You were exposed to so many people. It was like an incubator. Yes. Because you had, you might finish a film on Friday and start another one on Monday. Right. With a whole new cast of characters, not so much within your department, but all the other departments, art department, production, so forth. Uh, so that was like, to me, was a transformational time because you were exposed to so much from so many different people, from so many uh, areas of the world, yes. basically, uh, as far as uh, skill sets and so forth. And and everyone was very generous with their knowledge, and they were just wanting everything to go good. Yeah, well, you know, that time for me, we were all thrown to the wolves. We were all given lots of opportunity, and many mistakes were made. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, the, and, you can't be afraid to make a mistake. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and um and I I learned early on that you know the the circle would form, the screaming and shouting would start, mm -hmm. and I learned that if you'd raise your hand and say it was your fault, if you hey it's my fault, I noticed the screaming would stop yeah. and people would settle down. And says okay, what well, I'm going to do to fix it? Yeah. So I learned my 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 line is I'm always been very good at making mistakes. I'm even better at fixing them. Right. Right. <laughs> The probably the weirdest thing to me was um, not so, not so much weird, but the beginning of the abyss when we got the I got the job. We showed up with the crew, and so Ken shows me the schedule. They want to start filming on eight eight eighty eight, and here it was already like the end of May, right? And they were just doing the uh, gun hiding. In a tank, still still building the swimming pool, still yeah. building the pool, still doing the infrastructure for the pool, and it's like, who who did this schedule? Who did this budget? And the budget was done in some room out in L.A. by who knows who right. knows who. I don't think anybody in the art department created that budget, right? As much as they maybe acquiesced to it, you know. Somebody said, well, this is the money you're given. But, you know, as soon as, you know, 
Ken started the film, then he got fired. Before he got fired, they brought this guy, Jamie Orndorff, in because he was going to be the coordinator. He spent one week, and he says, no way. So he stayed on, and they brought George Stokes on, and then they fired Ken. And then George worked for X amount of time, and he got another job offer. So he brings another coordinator in, a guy named Mort Zwicker. And Mort brings a foreman with him, a guy named Dick Rankin. And so George starts a film with this guy. Uh, have you ever heard of the name Harold Schneider? Yes. He was a famous hatchet man. Yes, yes. So he goes out there to work with Harold, and then that show falls apart. So George comes back and tells Mort to take a hike. So Mort, Lee, Mort goes back to L.A. He actually goes to Florida to do a show. But uh, it was like, by that time, we'd come in, uh, August the 8th had come and gone. That was a pipe dream. Right. And reality had set in. And George, to his credit, you know, he'd been down this road before. He says, nah, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen when you want it to happen. This is when you can see it happening. This is how much it's really going to cost. And, you know, that that budget of, I think it was three and a half million was the original construction budget. They probably doubled that by the time it was over. And that was just like, to, to say the weirdest thing, to start off being so behind the eight ball. Right. I mean, we worked seven twelves. We had 4th of July off from the day we started. Then our next day off was Labor Day. You know, my experience in set dressing was different. I'm be- a, we were behind you guys, so yeah, you guys were, you know, carrying the flag, and um, and we were very regular <laughs> in set dressing. Yeah, um, we worked twelve hour days, six days a week. We ate lunch every day at this big board table that we had in our warehouse. Mm-hmm. And very regular experience. We, you know, took a nap after lunch. Yeah. <laughs> so on my end, it, w- it was a very different yeah. kind of yeah. um, experience. Yeah. It was. Um, but having said that, it was once again, you got to learn a lot and you got to cut your teeth on things that you would not have ordinarily been able to. And, 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 it, and it also required that that massive metal fabrication crew that came in. Well, and those guys were local. Um, uh, it was a local contractor called Sanders Brothers. And they started off, we used a couple of different fab companies, one in uh, Spartanburg, maybe one in Greenville, to do the the big tubes, the 15-foot right. diameter uh, parts of, di- of deep core. And then we hooked up with Sanders Brothers, and then they had kind of seemingly endless resources as far as personnel went. I mean, at at some point, I had to do the time cards every week. We would have over 250 people from their operation working on that show. Good heavens. And and not uh, not all on site. You know, they did a lot of the infrastructure, the beams and everything over the tank, but they were fabricating stuff back at their shop. And, uh, and And that is another thing to George Stokes' credit would not have happened had he not reached way outside of the the box to uh, make that happen. Do you remember the foreman's name or the guy that it would shimmy up the I-beams and stuff? Lizard. Lizard. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I do remember and I, uh, that we finished all the metal work and then we're building the interiors mm-hmm. on stage. Yeah. And they had to come in and do a certain amount of metal work. But all yeah. of a sudden we're building everything they did out of metal, out of wood and glue. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was a big change. There's, that was scenery. What they were doing <laughs> was something else. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, you know, usually I have a, you know, a tool belt with a screw gun. Mm-hmm. Um, when we were working in the tank, I had a welder. I had mm-hmm. my own personal welder yeah. as, my, yeah. as my tool, you know, yeah. so to speak. You know, there was one, uh, I don't know if you recall, you remember we built, because uh, you and I were kind of one of the few folks there early on where mm-hmm. we mocked up an interior set. Mm-hmm. And um, we went in, and I think you put up just a simple Luan form, and I filled it full of set dressing, right. and we hung a bunch of stuff from the ceiling. Mm-hmm. And Jim Cameron came in and did a walkthrough. Yeah. 
and uh, Leslie was there, and then we had Leslie, the art department coordinator, taking notes. I forget her name. Mary Carol Palmer. Mary Carol Palmer, taking notes. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I was there. We saw the whole thing. And I remember Jim Cameron saying, you know, I want the, the ceiling height at six foot eight. Mm-hmm. And when Mary uh, Palmer released her notes, she said, had seven foot eight. I knew it was a mistake, yeah. but I assumed that she, she heard something it. different yeah. or yeah. that someone, mm-hmm. and I assumed it, and then we had to go in. Yeah. We built all the scenery. Jim comes in and says, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> and we had to go in and lower everything, yeah. and I knew it. That's, that's one of those things you got to speak up. Mm-hmm. you got to know. And that's, yeah. and, I'm, or, and I needed to own responsibility. I said, you yeah. know what? I knew that was a mistake. I should have spoken up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not everybody hears the same thing at the same time. I mean, where in the world would you build a spaceship? You build a submarine. You build a baseball field. You build a football field. You build a basketball court. And, uh, well, the, you and I did the, th- the pilot on One Tree Hill. That's right. We, we poured that shitty <laughs> basketball court over at the Battleship Park. Yeah, yeah. And, you, you, and I think you could, I could quote you on that. He says, he said, just make it shitty. And yeah. and uh, and some of it was on purpose and some of it was not because the concrete started setting up on us before we were done screeding right. it off and it got kind of choppy there at the end. But uh, I think we we succeeded with shitty. You, you did all right. And I had to um, – I brought the same edict to uh, Summer Catch when we were building the um, the dugouts. Right. You know, I think Frank Pearson was doing was Frank the, uh, Pearson. He was doing the dugouts. Frank yeah. Pearson. And I said, I don't want straight lumber. I said, yeah. if I'm going to go find crooked lumber, and and ultimately did a great job of building um, wacky, yeah. Yeah, build crooked, character into it. Build yeah. character into it. Yeah. You know, I worked in Berlin on Homeland, mm. and the Germans. <laughs> but one of the first sets we had to build there was a brothel. And um and I go to these guys and so you know we had partitions between the rooms and I said you know I, you know how that it, it warps and gets crooked and they just looked at me and says why would you build anything that would warp and go crooked <laughs> Germans did not understand that at all why why would you do that <laughs> and um and it's not logical it's not, yeah. well they just not practical that they they would never build anything that would warp later on. Pearson put up a big argument because he wanted to be proud of his mm-hmm. work. And, one yeah, is yeah. Doug, and, the, and the Germans put up the same argument. And um, ultimately, I think I prevailed. Did you work on um, domestic disturbance? I was a prop guy. Okay. I worked on set. You know, they did, um, they were doing two endings to that, to that show. They wanted to have... Um, the underwater fight with John Travolta and um, I think it's Vince Vaughn. Yeah. So anyway, um, we went out to Pender County off of Highway 53, and I'm sure you couldn't do this today. This was in 2001. Um, some property owners had two ponds, so we took the smaller of the two ponds and we pumped all the water out of it. And we got down to, and we pumped it into the other pond. And we got down to the point where when, once it was knee deep, we went in, in waders and we scooped out the fish that were still in there. We moved those to the other pond. And then we totally drained it out. We formed up and poured a driveway that went from the edge of the pond to the bottom of the pond. Concrete formed up the whole thing. And then they covered the entire interior of the pond with uh, rubber membrane roofing material. So it became sealed. And then they ran trucks 24 hours a day from fire hydrants in Burgall to fill that pond up. They did um, climate control 
and filtration on that pond. Oh my goodness. And then they, that's where um, whichever, I think it's a limousine that ends up going into the, into the pond and John Travolta and Vince Vaughn have an underwater fight. Yes. And all that was done so they could film it in that environment. You know, and it was a, and since the rubber membrane was black, you, it, you know, everything just falls off to nothing. Could have done yeah. it anywhere. You could have done it anywhere. But, <laughs> and then the, in the adjoining pond, we had built a steel ramp that where you actually, where the car actually goes into the water. On a track. Then you cut to the other one over there. And then at the end, we took it all out. We pumped the water <laughs> back into the other pond. And then I can't speak of the wildlife. Uh, I'm assuming that maybe it got repopulated. Oh, my goodness. Did Don Blanchard help you out on that? No, we, we did it all we ourselves because we, we, we rented a huge pump from Hertz. And we just laid the pipe out. You put the um, suction in one end and the discharge on the other end. And, you know, we did, uh, I jobbed out the driveway and uh, jobbed out the rubber membrane. We got a roofing company to do the, and they were like, what? <laughs> you want to roof a muddy pond? <laughs> yeah, well, no. Whatever, it whatever sure gets is. you through the day, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and but strangely enough, you know, they ended up doing a reshoot. They didn't like that ending. I guess they showed it to a test audience, right? And so we came back, and we we had uh, the house that John Travolta lived in in the story. We put in storage. It had been on stage four, and so we got the call to reshoot. So we they brought us in maybe a month ahead, and we. It was actually stored at, um, Hugh Scaife used to have a, a space over on Castle Hain Road. Right, We right. stored it there. Mm -hmm. We brought it back, we reconstructed it, and we um, did the filming. In the end, it's, he throws Vince Vaughn into a breaker panel, and he gets electrocuted in the garage after a big knockdown drag out fight. So we filmed that, and then we started the, uh, we started wrapping out, and Becky calls me on the phone. She says, um, she was at the Honda dealership having the oil change in the car. She says, a plane just hit the World Trade Center. Oof. And I, and I said, it's a terrorist attack. Because World Trade Center had, had been on there, had been a target for a long time, since 93. Right. And so I walked over to the production office, which was in the annex, and went to the producer's office. He had a he had the TV on by then, and we're sitting there watching the replay of the first tower getting hit. And then they were live, and then we watched the actual second tower getting hit live, right, right on the right on the TV screen. And it was like, holy shit! You know, um, while I was working on domestic disturbance, the um, local 491, they let. Uh, um, yeah, business agent go. Yeah, Tommy I remember. Love. Yeah, and um, and I volunteered, mm -hmm. and I became the interim business agent. Yeah, I remember that morning. I was driving onto the lot. You stepped out of the annex, knocked on my window as I drove by, and says, "You know what just happened?" You were the one that told me. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was just happened. I mean, it was just like holy mackerel. Becky and I had taken a trip to New York the previous February. And um, we'd done this fundraiser for uh, Opera House, and it was a, a auction thing. And we we got this trip, and we I got photos somewhere, but I took photos of the south end of Manhattan Island with the World Trade Center on our way to LaGuardia. And part of the uh, trip package was um, a, a, a gift card for uh, Windows on the World. So we had brunch on that Sunday morning on the, whatever it was, 104th floor right. of the North right. Tower. Wow. And the same year it went down. Yeah. And as, a, as we all remember, it was a super clear, clean, bright, sunny day. Yeah. That day. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. I mean, I, you can't unsee it. Yeah. So anyway, that, we moved on beyond that. We, we were wrapping out the show. 
and I get a call from Kelly Tenney, who was in the production office. He was doing the, um, and they had bought Bob, uh, Bob Girolami in to, to do the reshoots. Right. Stuart Newman wasn't available. So I get a call from Kelly, and he says, what's your call time tomorrow? I said, well, we start at 7 over on the stage. He says, I need to change your time to 8 a.m. I need you to be at um, Masonboro Boatyard with your golf clubs. I said, okay, count me in. <laughs> so I meet Kelly, Bob Girolami, and Jim Dyer, who was the line producer. We all have our golf clubs. We get in Bob Girolami's 28-foot Grady White. We motor down to Bald Head Island. We take the the tram over to the uh, clubhouse. We play nine holes of golf. Nice. We have lunch in the clubhouse. We go back. We play this back nine. Take the tram back to Bob's boat. He pours everybody a double doers, and we ride back up the Cape Fear as the sun's going down. <laughs> On the clock, all expenses paid. And I said, is this even happening, you know? But, you know, everybody was – bulletproof because we were with the line producer and we were doing what he asked us to do that day and uh <laughs> isn't that what makes wilmington special oh it's great yeah where else could you do something like that right yeah you know i remember on, on dawson's creek and boat scout <laughs> yeah for sure yeah <laughs> yeah it's amazing and you so, just drop what you're doing yeah and we know we're going to go for a boat ride yeah you never know yeah uh, Tom Jones Jr., thank yeah. you for joining us on Rat Beer. Absolutely, um, my pleasure. <laughs> your, your stories are, are um, revealing and special. Well, uh, I'm glad I'm able to remember what I do. <laughs> That's why we're doing it. You know, um, on Rat Beer, we're, here's our mission. You know, our mission is number one: document history. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we're we're losing a lot of our stories, and, and a um, lot of our people, and a lot of our people. And um, number two, we want to entertain. Yeah, and um, and then number three, in, in all this, maybe we educate a little bit. There's young people that want to figure out that maybe they want to join the circus. For sure, yeah. um, they may find a an, an avenue in mm -hmm. uh, through these tales. Yeah, yeah. There's lots more, but you know, you've got to compartmentalize it. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. We'll okay. come on, we'll come on back. All righty. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks, John. That's a wrap. Hi, this is Scott Davis. Here at Rat Beer, our number one priority is to capture the stories of our fellow filmmakers. Unfortunately, sometimes we lose that opportunity. We recently lost filmmaker John Verardi, first assistant camera. Now John was never short of friends, and a few of them spoke to us recently at his celebration of life. So, <laughs> too, when we were doing Homeland, um, we always lived in the same apartment of communities, and Johnny would always make us first breakfast. So we'd go to his house first, really? and he would make bacon and eggs and uh, coffee. And he had this old school percolator that made the best coffee. So we would have the coffee there. Then we'd go to work and have our real breakfast. So there was one day where I was working on a, a different unit than him, and... Uh, so I wasn't going to be able to make it over. We were going to go at different times. And when I left my apartment to go to work, sitting on my front stoop was a hot cup of coffee. And it just warmed my heart. When the crow shooting happened, <coughs> it was the loader. And when it appeared how seriously... Uh, He'd been, he'd been injured, and that they had cameras rolling for this whole thing, what, for what might be recording the crime. He's the one who taped up, pulled all the film, taped up the film, sealed it and put a tape on it, which he signed the signature on, he signed the seal on, on both ends of the tape, and he told the producer to put it in the safe so they could turn it in to authorities on Monday morning. He's the guy who said, you know, and for, everyone's like busy. He thought, nope, this is what has to happen now. Everyone else is running around 
I'm doing this. And he did it. Wow. At the hospital. And it was the same kind of thing. He was like, he recognized me for a second. And I was like, okay, cool. And then he was really like, all of a sudden he was like, guys, he goes, we're not doing, I'm worried about the car. We're not going to, I don't want to do the stunt. He goes, make sure whoever's going to do it. He goes, don't let those motherfuckers get you in that car. He goes, I don't trust them. He goes, I want to see what the car is going to do. And so, uh, uh, who was it? It was me. It was uh, Patrick Groveriak in there. And we said, Johnny, it's okay, man. I said, we're not. I mean, he totally went into work mode. And he was just like, he was like, I don't want to. I don't want you guys to not be safe. And he was just, I don't know, it was just like super gracious. And he was just like concerned about us. As he always. No, I know. And he was just like, he goes, but it was just so funny. He was like, don't let those motherfuckers do He goes, I don't trust them. He goes, I want to see what the thing's going to do. We just said, Johnny, it's okay, dude. I said, we've, we've canceled the stunt. We're not doing the stunt tonight. We're, you know, he's sitting in his hospital bed. And he's like, he's all right. He goes, well, let's go home. Go get my car. He goes, let's go home. And I'm Black night. We we're just starting the show. And we got all this talk about number one on the call sheet, and don't look at them. Don't, don't even think about it. Just put your eyes in a different direction. And China's like, what is this bullshit? That's my job is to look at this guy. <laughs> And they're like, well, Johnny, you're just going to have to find a way to, to work around it. And he's like, I could not work around it for this guy. <laughs> so first set up, Martin comes on stage. After we've worked it all out with the stand-ins, Martin comes on stage. And Johnny, like he always does, hooks the tape up to the camera and runs it out to Martin's face and puts it right <laughs> up next to his eye. His eyes about came out of his sockets. He's like, what the hell? What are you doing? What's happening here? He's like, I'm just doing my job. He says, no, 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 nobody does that. And he ran off the stage. It took us about two hours to get him back on stage. And Johnny's like, I don't care. I'm just doing my job. It, it, you know, if he's not in focus, there's no sense in shooting this. <laughs> There's a lot of stories. My favorite quote that he ever said, uh, we were working on a show late at night and uh, in the dark, there's a big party going on and the actress in question, uh, someone had given her real, she wanted real wine. So she drank like three glasses of wine. So she's a little tipsy and she's wandering all over her marks. Johnny's getting frustrated. He pulls a tape out. I'm laying marks down for him. He's twirling it back to, to the camera. The first day he goes, Johnny, you good? He goes, nope, but I'm available. Let's go. <laughs> When I moved from the electric department to the camera department, I knew Johnny. Johnny knew me, and he said, "Hey, I got, I got some advice for you." And he said, "Listen, the best thing you can do is to keep your mouth closed rather than open it up and let them know how stupid you are." And I, I struggle with that still, but whenever I say something stupid i always think about johnny telling me to just just be quiet man Dave's johnny on eastbound and down we were doing a burning burning sequence um they were taking all of the memorabilia and they were gonna burn it so they set it all on fire it was really late at night we did the burn the footage comes in the next day and it's all out of focus. And the visiting DP tried to blame John and said it was his fault. There was no light, he underlit the scene. And John explained that he was wide open on this lens that they had and did everything that he could. And Danny McBride knew that it was not John, that he was an excellent, you know, first AC, and he had done the best job possible, that it was the DP, and the DP threw him under, and I stepped up and said, this is, this is what this means, we were explaining it to Danny because he was new in the business, and they got rid of the DP, and John stayed. Which is one day, I went to go pick him up, and he, get in the, he got in the car, and this was right after he just got his dentures, and he didn't have them in, 
and I didn't say anything because I was like, whatever. And we start to drive out of the parking lot, and he's like, damn it, Patrick, what did you do? You, I forgot my teeth. And I'm like, well, Johnny, I didn't want to say anything. He's like, what do you mean you didn't want to say anything? You're going to let me go to work like that? And I just thought it was like, well, I, I guess that's what you're doing now. So we had to whip back around, and he ran it. I think we can all agree out. that Johnny was, he was very real. Yeah. He yeah. was who he was. Yeah, he was in the moment, and it's, it was nearly just all black he, and white. No. Yeah, yeah exactly. He, he didn't put on any airs. No. He didn't pretend to be something he wasn't. It was just like, hey, this is what I am. Yeah. This is what you get. Yeah. yeah. You, know? you hired me to do the best I could do. This is how I do it. <laughs> and I love that about him. Yeah. I love that about him. I'll tell you, um, John was my boss, my first first eight camera first boss on Bolden. Um, I annoyed him until he gave me a job. Um, I used to be in the, in the uh, office, uh, and I would like always make sure to make sure I found Johnny Mac and Johnny V and give them sodas first. And be like, who's got? Where's the lunch order? I'll take it and just go and, and kiss ass. Um, but I remember um, one of the first times he sat me down with a job to do was on the camera truck, and he said, uh, hey, "Andy Bader, um, you have a you went to film school, right?" And I said, "Yes, sir, I did." And he said, uh, "Do you have a diploma?" And I said, "Yes, sir, I do." He said, "Great, I want you to take that diploma and these scrubbing bubbles, and I want you to clean off all these lens cases with it because that's what it's worth. You're here to learn, right?" I said, yes, sir. So. I just think he's uh, an ultimate pro, and that's basically it. You know, I always respected him and, um, you know, enjoyed working with him, being in his company. Always good to be with a pro. Another uh, funny story, once again, on Homeland was uh, um, it was sort of the beginning of digital, and we were all sort of getting our feet on that, and we were learning how to wing it, basically, because they just wanted to shoot without cutting. And at one point, we do a take, and we need to do it again, and we do it a second time. And from Video Village, they yell, hey, what's wrong? Why didn't we get that? And without missing a beat, he just goes, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> And so I say that all the time to this day. I still, I still use that quote. Like, why, why did we miss that? It's hard. <laughs> Filmmaking can be hard. So is losing a friend. We will miss you, Johnny V. And the next time we see you, we'll buy you a beer. And so from all of us here at Rap Beer, be kind.